and, and what, but you have to be careful about it because I had a snag in my backyard that blew over the other day into my neighbor's yard. We've been having a little bit of wind lately. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. He he told me I should cut it down, but then I had convinced him, no, it's so great because the woodpeckers love it and everything. Well, oh boy, thank God it didn't hurt his property in any way or anybody. So yeah, it can be treated. The tree can be treated. It's very expensive, and you'd have to do it every year. So it's really not much of an option for most homeowners. Right. Now, if people want to get involved with the Master Gardener program, okay. for one thing, what do they expect that they'll experience once they're in it? Well, it's, it's, the program is, is for, um, it's not for people with a lot of horticultural training. It's for people who like to garden and who want to learn more and want to volunteer, share their knowledge, because it's very much about volunteering in the community once you've uh, completed the program. So um, we the classes are great. It's everything from soup to nuts. I mean, we have PhD Pfizer scientists. We have people who work for the post office. We have all kinds of people, lots of people who've been doing one particular type of gardening for a long time, like flower gardening or vegetable gardening. And um, but, but we're not looking for any special uh, prior training or experience. It's really open to everybody. Um, and we cover all the basics. It's, it's, it's fabulous. Uh, a full day on soils, the importance of the soil, because that's where it all begins. Um, plant pathology, which is, that's one of the harder ones, I think. We do you, uh, refer a lot of problems to a, a pathologist up at UConn for diagnosis, but then we have a wonderful guy who teaches vegetables. He's such an enthusiastic vegetable gardener himself, and he shares all the tips and all the <laughs> techniques that he has with everybody. Um, so that's great, and then um, we do talk about invasive plants. We, there are plants that are invasive that can still be purchased in the trade, and we try to tell people not to do that. Um, ornamentals, woody, woodies, uh, trees and shrubs, um, and uh, what else? Um, it's it's e and each topic is in one full day, like a nine nine to four class. So it's pretty intense. Um, but one of the things that's so nice about it is by the end of the, it's really a nine month. It takes nine months to complete the whole program to to be certified. Um, by the end, people are such good friends. All these people yeah. who didn't know each other before have become great friends. I know there's a group of women who always go for walks together because they just love to go out in the woods and look for things. And um, some others who work at Camp Harkness for the Handicapped, which is one of our best programs, I think. And they become friends, and they go back year after year. So it's really, it's, it's really nice that way. Now. What's the application process like? Okay. Is it hard to get into it? It's, it's really, um, to an extent, first come, first serve. We, one of the limitations is the size of the classroom, and that varies in each center. My classroom is not that big, so it's good for people to get the applications in. Um, we're accepting applications now. Uh, the best place to download it is on the website, which is mastergardener.yukon.edu. And, and it's on the screen. It's on the screen. Oh, okay. terrific. Okay. Thank you. So go to that website and you can download the application and it's, it's not difficult. It takes a little bit of time. We ask people to write an essay on why they want to do it. And lots of people say, well, I learned to garden with my grandparents and I've always liked it. So it's, you know, it's that right. kind of thing. Um, we um, want to make sure that people understand that it's 16 weeks of class. There's a written exam at the end. And then you go on to doing the outreach work, which is pretty much you have from April to September to complete that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, there's, I mean, where, as I say, we're not looking for um, exceptional horticultural experience, gardening experience. And some people who, a lot of people who take it have recently retired, 
and they have been very busy with their jobs. They haven't had time to do a lot of volunteer work, and we say that's fine, we understand that, but you've got to be willing to do the volunteer work. And we, you know, list the various categories, doing outreach at fa agricultural fairs, working with kids, um, town beautification projects, all kinds of possibilities, and we, we help them figure out what to do once they're in the program. Now, in the, this area, what kind of projects have people been involved in? Well, I mentioned Camp Harkness for the handicapped, um, which is really a nice program. Uh, many uh, Master Gardeners volunteer at the Arboretum, Connecticut College Arboretum. They do docent tours. Um, we have um, we have some people doing school projects. I'm really in trying to encourage people to think about doing school gardens. It's so important for kids to learn that vegetables don't just come out of a can. And right. when they grow them, they get so excited about it. Um, so we did have a couple of people this year doing a program with a middle school um, where they worked with students and uh, staff. Uh, another person did some uh, gardening uh, with another uh, school here in New London. They did container gardening, I think, because they didn't have a lot wow. of space. So that that's a really um, important area. Well, we have a phone call. Oh, okay. So let's... Hi, thanks for calling. No? Yes? Hi, Rana. Hi, Susan. This is Constance. Christmas. Hi, Constance. <laughs> so what can we do for you tonight? Actually, I'm really home, and let alone watching TV, and I saw you guys on TV, and I wanted to say hi, and I have the TV on, and it's, oh, <laughs> I, I, and I'm hearing myself, so I shut it off. Um, yes, yes. I just wanted to say hi and ask you about the Master Gardening Program, Susan. Okay. Okay. Do you? Well, yeah. Go ahead. Do you need to have an active garden when you're in the program, or will all your exercises be at the school and your outreach programs? Oh, no. Um, most people do have a garden of their own. Sometimes it's not a very big garden, and sometimes they start expanding it as they're taking the program. But the outreach is done, uh, could be done any number of places. Uh, could be done at an historic site. Um, it could be a town beautification project. Um, it could be, uh, I'm trying to think, I always go blank on these things. What are people doing? Um, what type all, of hours do you put in for uh, that outreach? Okay, the hours, uh, it's a total of 60 hours, which you have from May 1st to September. So spread over that amount of time, it's not too bad. Um, 30 hours have to be done in the office answering questions. So if Rana has a question as to why her uh, squash didn't do very well, right. she could call the Master Gardener and office. Say, the leaves are all wilting. What did I do wrong? Right. <laughs> and so the Master Gardeners, one of the things we very often say, first off, is get all the information, ask the questions, where is it growing, how do we, you know, so on and so forth. We'll get back to you because we are not expecting anybody to always know the answer to every question right away. It's it's um, so you do thirty at least thirty hours in the office um, in shifts of a half a day. That's usually the way I set it up in my office. So you could come in in the morning or you could come in in the afternoon. And um, the other 30 of the 60 hours are done on a project in the community. Okay, so it doesn't have to be at your home, and you don't really necessarily no. need a home plot at all. No, no, it shouldn't be at your home, actually. It should be somewhere else. There are a couple of things. You can't do it for money. <laughs> it's, it's volunteer. You can't do it for a private entity. It has to be a, a public kind of situation. And it can't be a religious organization because it's Yukon and separation of church and state kind of thing. So, but there are a lot of um, soup kitchen gardens, community gardens, and some of them are at churches, as a matter of fact. Um, but as long as it's open to the public, that's fine. Um, 
So, uh, and, and we have lots of master gardeners working at places like that now. So somebody in next year's class could go and work at a site like that with a bunch of other master gardeners. So they're not on their own. Great. So does Sounds that help? Fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it sounds nice. I just wanted to say hi, hear more about the program. Um, great way to get experience and get in the, compu in the community. So yeah, good, good job, yeah. Susan. Yeah. Nice, see nice okay. seeing you online, guys. Yeah, thanks, okay. questions. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> so now that it sounds so great, uh, um, the application process is not it's, too it's, arduous. You know, it's a number of pages, but it's, it's not difficult at all. Um, some of it just is, you know, you pick which location you want to go to. Uh, there is a fee, uh, $425, which when you think about it, a, a semester course at a university or college would be at least $1,000. So for what you get, I, I think it's, it's worth it. Um, it's, uh, the instructors are fabulous. They really they're all gardeners themselves, and they know the kinds of questions and the kinds of issues that come up and what we need to know um, to, it's very practical, very hands-on, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, and they, they, they really are good. I, I think it amazes me how good they are. Uh, I learn something every year sitting through them. Uh, now, I, since this is based at the extension service, right, at yeah. UConn, so I want to kind of back up a little off the Master Gardener program mm -hmm. for a while, although people are welcome to call in with questions about that. Mm -hmm. And going into a little history, UConn is a land-grant university, yes, and it is. so it's got an agricultural extension. Yeah. How did all that happen, and what, what's the function of, the, of that part of the university? Well, it, it's, it's pretty interesting, I think. Um, back in the 19th century, there was a senator from Vermont named Mr. Morrill, and he came from a farming family, and he went to Washington, D.C., and he felt that there should be training for agricultural people. Um, universities at the time, they taught Greek and philosophy and these kind of things, but he felt there should be a place where people could go to learn mechanics, how to fix their tractors, and how to deal with issues of erosion control, this kind of thing. So in the depths of the Civil War, 1862, Congress passed what is known as the Morrill Act. You know, I mean, they did it. It was a great thing that they did, because the Morrill Act established uh, the need for a land-grant university in every state that would provide this kind of uh, training and do research, agricultural research, teaching, and outreach uh, relating to the community, taking the university knowledge right. out into the public. So many years later, UConn became the land-grant university, and then the extension was established as a way of really reaching out to the community. And that, that's, that's really what the extension system is about, and the Master Gardener program is part of UConn Extension, along with 4-H. People have heard of 4-H. They, now, so has 4-H always been part of the Extension, or did it have its own life at one time? I don't know. Probably, I, don't, I would guess. I mean, they're all over the place. I know they have all these little kids running around our office all the time doing stuff. I, they're I know there's a 4-H camp up in Brooklyn, yeah. because when I was taking some classes at, at Eastern, uh -huh. I don't know, in the 1980s, I think we spent some time up in Brooklyn at, mm -hmm. at the 4-H site. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's terrific. I mean, it's a really dynamic program. And the, another program that they have, um, they, people are, well, mostly, I think, work out of the Middlesex County office, but it deals with um, water quality, water protection issues for municipalities. So when we have these huge floods now, these torrential downpours and the sewer system, the sewer overflows all back right, up. Right, and, and the pumps yeah. can't deal with the capacity. And it's a problem in all our older cities because they just haven't kept up. So the emphasis really is to create more bioretention basins, rain gardens, buffer zones, create buffer zones where the water will filter into the groundwater. So that's a very good program. And that's, again, it's extension. It's reaching out 
to the community, taking the university knowledge out to the community. And same with the Master Gardener program. Well, you know, you talked about the stormwater issue, and mm -hmm. even the federal government is taking uh, some initiative because it, it's a problem with our waterways getting polluted. Right. And um, I know New London got a grant, and mm -hmm. to, you know, during the rainstorm we just had, when I drove downtown, I chose not to go on Pequot Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there oh, are some yeah. places you just. Don't I don't want to go. It's, it, it's a chronic issue. And it, 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 it really is, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to do a quick announcement that next Sunday, I don't know if um, most of you who have watched, been watching uh, know this, but the New London Greens decided that this fall we were going to do some park cleanups as part of our outreach to mm -hmm. the community. And we all like park cleanups, of course. So we started out in Riverside Park in early September, and then we spent one day in uh, a couple weeks ago in Bates Woods, and in two hours collected eight bags of trash from an extremely small area, <laughs> like yeah. where the boulder is. Uh -huh. um, oh my God, I can imagine, yeah. But this Sunday we're going to be at, um, at Green Harbor. Oh, okay. And so yeah. we're going to do cleanup at the beach and uh -huh. on the, in the park, and we'll have a cookout afterwards oh, nice. and talk about stormwater. Mm -hmm. We are hoping, uh, and this isn't really part of the Greens, it's a side thing I got myself into, mm -hmm. to, to s work on trying to find a partial solution to the uh, stormwater issue at Green Harbor and Pequot yeah. by creating a bioretention yeah. field yeah. towards the back uh, mm -hmm. of the park where the Phragmites grow. Yeah, uh, yeah that's great. <laughs> so it's in a very early stage, but we'll get to talk about some of those possibilities as well yeah. because you know the way to one of the best ways to keep the roads from flooding is to keep the water from getting to, to the, the road. road. Yeah, and I imagine it comes down from the higher elevation where the railroad tracks go through. Right. And, uh, yeah, well, there's a lot of space there. there. It'd be a terrific place. And there are a lot of nice plants that you can put in a rain garden. The idea is, depending a little bit on the site, but there are plenty of uh, plants, of native plants, that like that can do very well in a situation where the roots are periodically flooded, but then also very dry. Um, uh, let me see, red twig dogwood, aronia, um, oh, one of my favorites, which I can't grow because I don't have enough moisture, uh, cardinal flower, blueberries, lots yeah. of really nice native plants that are very happy in that kind of situation because I guess our soil here is, is very sandy, well-drained, um, and so any plants that are native to this area are used to being dry, getting dried out pretty regularly. Right. Uh, but we have a lot of humidity in the air, and that really helps them. So, uh, yeah, that would be a really great thing to do there. And there's plenty of land to, to put something yeah, nice There is in. some land there that isn't being used yeah. otherwise because it is choked with invasives. Yeah. I, I remember a couple of years ago we had an event at Riverside Park in... I think it was for the regatta, so it might have been late May. Uh -huh. And someone just showed up and said, we were supposed to have a party at Green Harbor, and it's flooded. Because it had just rained oh, the yeah. day before, and it was a, like yeah. an inch and a half of rain. And the lawn was still soaking Soggy. wet there. Yeah, I can imagine. So, yeah. you know, they wanted to move their party to the high ground. <laughs> and they yeah. did. Mm -hmm. But it's a chronic problem there. Well, aren't we lucky in New London? We've got Riverside Park, which is kind of ledgy and dry and high up. Right. And then Greens Harbor, which gets soggy and wet. And we then Ocean everything. Beach. I mean, we have all these different habitats right in our city. And someday, of course, <laughs> you and I took a walk a year or two ago, uh, the area near the old mill, yeah. Yeah. which uh, right now is kind of a mess, mm -hmm. but is has the potential to be really nice. Mm -hmm. I was inside the fence once, and there there is a blue heron, no, a night heron that oh. lives in there. Oh, nice. Oh, my God. So I saw that it's, it was wow. up in a tree during the day. Said, what is this? And I sent a picture around, and yeah. someone mm -hmm. ID'd it, and mm -hmm. there, there's, real, there's wildlife in there, yeah. and it really could be nice, except it's been choked with invasives. 
Well, you know, it, it's amazing how much wildlife there is in the city. We have our flock of turkeys now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen them for a little while, but uh, they seem to be quite comfortable living right in downtown in urban New London. Um, we are one of the things that we, we do encourage people to do is um, consider making a part of their property, and it doesn't have to be very big, but what we call a buffer zone, which uh, an area that you just don't really manage very much. You just kind of let it be. It gets a little shrubby um, because it's great for the wildlife, and it's also great for letting the uh, rain the precipitation percolate into the groundwater rather than rushing down the pavement. Um, so that uh, people want lawns, and, and lawns are nice in a lot of ways, but the, the picture-perfect lawn is a really high-maintenance lawn. Uh, requires a fair amount of chemical input, a um, fair amount of watering. Of course, you can get all these products now uh, winterize your lawn, keep it green during the drought when the grass really just wants to go dormant. I, all these things to, you know, pump it up, pump it up, pump it up. And we try to get people to think, well, maybe you don't want to do that. Um, we, yes. we uh, in the Master Gardener program, we cannot recommend any specific product. We cannot mention, sp recommend a particular service or a particular uh, st uh, store. What we do say, if we've diagnosed a problem, we, we really try to encourage people to think of the least toxic control right. method, integrated pest management, IPM. Uh, and once we figure out what the problem is, we can suggest what the control might be. Now, if it's a really valuable specimen tree that the homeowner is determined to treat in some yeah. way will say, this is the problem, now you have to go to your garden center and you look for a product that will deal with this spe and, and specific, specific problem. Yeah. And not the kind of thing that kills everything, everything in sight. If you can find, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's terrible when somebody comes in and says, well, my tree is um, not looking so good, so I'm going to spray it. And we say, well, What's wrong with it to it start hits. with, you know? Maybe somebody hits it every week with a string trimmer, and that's what's the problem, <laughs> which, yeah, you, know, you, you have to know what, what, how to deal with it. You have to think about it almost as though, you know, if we have medical problems, oh, like, yeah. you don't just right. take, like, everything in your medicine cabinet if you wake up feeling not yeah, great. Yeah, exactly. It's the same kind of thing, yeah. Now, integrated, you mentioned integrated pest management, and yeah. I've heard that before. That isn't really necessarily strictly organic. It's No, it, it isn't. Um, the way it's described is you start with the, it's a continuum of methods. You start with the least toxic. Um, if you're a commercial grower, say, of fruit trees, you're probably going to spray because that's yeah. the only way you can get marketable crop. Sure. We had a fruit plum tree for about three or four years, and it was fantastic. And then one year, we had a really humid summer, mm -hmm. and it was invaded with a fungus, and mm -hmm. we never, we ended up cutting down the tree. Yeah. But if we were a commercial grower, we would have had to do something else. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's unfortunate. But interestingly enough, they say that it's the homeowners who are the most, the biggest users of commercial sprays now. The I mean, wow. uh, of, of uh, chemicals and all. The, the commercial growers are very into integrated pest management. They will do any number of things, traps, uh, monitoring, um, whatever, before they go to using the chemical sprays because they're liability issues, it's expensive, and they don't yeah. want to pollute the ground any more than anybody else. Sure. I mean, after all, we we all are hearing about the um, decline in the honeybee population, which is a really serious, scary situation because so much of our uh, food is pollinated by honeybees. Right, honeybees and other bees. And other bees, yeah. So, and and the 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 what's causing the decline of honeybees seems to be a number of things. There are some mites. There could be some 
pesticides. It, it's a variety right. of things. So um, it's really a, not a good idea to use these things too much. You know, you, you go to the store and you buy a big jar of something. <laughs> you use it once. And then what do you do? You take the rest of it to the hazardous waste collection. It, that it, it's happens not a good pretty, idea. Yeah, yeah. It happens very often. It does. Yeah. Now you mentioned the, the bees, and and I looked on the extension website, mm -hmm. and you know there's one part that says hot topics, and I think the the number one thing on their hot topics list was encouraging bees. Uh, yes, we do the hot topics class every year. It, it's just for certified master gardeners and. The hot topic this year was pollinators. Uh, the woman who gave the program is with the Ag Station and she studies, um, this is her field, uh, so she gave a very good presentation for Master Gardeners and she provided us with a lot of information um, on lists of good plants that are good for pollinators. Goldenrod is a fabulous Plant. And it is gorgeous right now. It really is, yes. And if you just swarming with little bees and wasps and all kinds of beneficial. And it does not deserve the bad rap for allergies, it I have does. to mention. Oh, no, it doesn't. It's, it's ragweed that causes. <laughs> right, and mugwort, I've heard as well. Mugwort might be too, and that's a horrible thing. Ugh. Uh, but yes, so. Blueberries, I read, were really good pollen for pollinators I, they too. They are good, yes, yes. And, you know, you get. Fruit, right? right. Yeah, uh, yep. And 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 different pollinators are out at different times of year, and and not just pollinators, but lots and lots of little wasps and bees, um, other kinds of bees, are very beneficial, uh, not only as pollinators, but also because they go after the the pest insects. So I don't know. People have seen. You've probably seen this, Ronnie. You know the great tomato hornworm, oh, yeah, huge green worm that's just so awful. Yeah. We found one, uh, not this past year, but the year before in the Riverside Community Garden. Oh, really? And it was covered with the wasp eggs. Good, good, yeah. So we let it be. Let it be, yeah. We let it, but uh, yeah. when we first saw it, it was really shocking looking. It's really <laughs> because they are huge. They're, oh, they're an inch and a half long and oh, fat yeah. and green. And getting them off, they hang on for dear life. So I, if I see one, I just cut the whole stem off because I don't want to try to get the caterpillar but off. But I was happy to see that it was all covered with the parasitic wasp eggs. Yes. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, this teeny little wasp destroys this great big um, uh, caterpillar. Now, then there are sort of decisions that have to be made. For example, the, um, um, the black swallowtail butterfly, a lovely right. butterfly, its caterpillar um, loves parsley and rue and various other plants in that family. It's a really zany caterpillar. You know, it's this chartreuse green and black and white stripes. In fact, I just brought a pe uh, uh, some sprigs of parsley in from my garden the other day, and I was just about to snip them, and I saw the caterpillar, so oh, I wow. took it back out and put it out in the garden. Yeah, so uh, for us home gardeners, who cares if some of the parsley is eaten by the caterpillar? Let it go, right. because we want to see the butterfly. Right, and, and I noticed this year, I mean, there's, always, this, there's been talk for a few years about the monarchs yeah. and mm. milkweed, and we have sort of late in the summer we started seeing some monarchs riverside mm. park we have lots of kinds of milkweed uh -huh. we have the swamp milkweed and the regular whatever rose milk milkweed and the butterfly yeah. weed yeah. and i'm not sure which they like best but yeah. we have started seeing some monarchs there so oh, i guess it works good, good. yeah um i think everybody's growing milkweed like crazy now um, of course, part of the problem is that when they're coming back north in the spring, and there are several generations of them, you know, they get to some of the big agricultural states where they've just herbicided the whole area and there's no more milkweed. Yeah. So that, that's a problem. Connecticut's kind of advantageous in a way that it's, even though we have commercial farms, there yeah. aren't the huge expanses of farms that there are in the plains right, areas. Right, so yeah. I'm guessing it's easier to find 
hedgerows and yeah, areas I, I that, that, that are wilder even among yeah. where the farming areas are. Yeah, yeah, and as I say, I think, I think in this state anyway, farm, farmers are, are pretty aware of the need to protect the wildlife. Yeah. Now, there are a couple events coming up that I had seen looking at the website, mm -hmm. and soon is something at your extension about mushrooms. Oh, yes, yes. Right. <laughs> um, in addition, we, we have the regular program uh, from January to September. And then <clears throat> we offer short classes, two day, uh, two day, two hour classes uh, in the spring and in the fall. We don't do it in the summer, but we, we and, and they're offered all around the state. So yes, I have the mushroom one next week. Um, now, are those open to the public, too? The, they are, yes. They are open to the public. Um, and he's going to be talking about wild mushrooms in Connecticut, mainly. Uh, one thing we do, we, we are very strictly told we do not recommend, we don't identify mushrooms, we don't identify snakes, we don't identify ticks, anything that in, involves possible human health hazard, right. we, don't, we don't deal with that at all. We're not trained to deal with that. Um, but yes, yes, mushrooms. And um, I had another one a couple of weeks ago on uh, plant propagation using stem cuttings oh, wow. and uh, layering and various ways that you can clone new plants other than growing from seed. Uh, so they're all over the place. Uh, I'm going to do one in November on making a living wreath, which is sort of a fun oh, wow. thing to do. A uh, living wreath. Yes, a living wreath. Yes, and in November, and it does work. I do it every year myself. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, and programs are given all around the state. Uh, the catalog is up on that website, mastergardener.ucon.edu. So people can go there and and see what's there that might appeal to them. Yep. And, and looking around today, I also looked at the extension.ucon.edu. Mm -hmm. And let's see, I found on Saturday, I found that in East Haddam, in Old Saybrook or East Haddam, mm -hmm. there's Worm Day. Worm Day, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, it's, Worm Day. <laughs> it's part of what I'm this, this is about, I think this is about growing um, the red wrigglers that people grow. I don't, I'm not directly involved in this, but it's, yeah, vermi composting. People uh, have these little red wriggler worms, which they keep in the house, and they put their, their uh, leaf, their, you know, their compostable oh, yeah. stuff, and the worms compost it, and then it's great composting for the garden, and people really like doing it. <laughs> yeah, in fact, well, you know, we only compost outside, but yeah. I know, um, Many years ago, one of my preschool students came from a family that composted, had worm uh -huh. composting inside and, you know, a big compost pile outside. And when we were not very environmentally sound in the class, when we didn't have a kitchen or anything, so <laughs> everything, all the peels and everything got put in the trash. And she yeah. would tell us which of the peelings they would put in their worm composters at home and which yeah, went into the other pile. <laughs> They're pretty voracious feeders, I guess. I'm looking to see if um, there's anything on the bad worms. Oh, <laughs> the interesting thing yeah, is I'd that earthworms in are not native. I've been seeing these really huge yeah. worms that are kind of they look weird like, looking. Yeah, they're sort of colorful. They're sort of iridescent. Yeah, like and I I think they're going to talk about this. Um, Worms from the earth, heaven and hell. I think they're going to talk about the bad ones. Apparently, <laughs> I guess before the European settlements began, there weren't earthworms here. They all really? came over with everything else that came over oh, from wow. Europe. Yeah. And so they're beneficial, except I think too much of 
something is not always good. So they'll probably talk about that a little bit. Yeah, some of those too. big ones, I, I don't know if they're supposed to be at all harmful in home gardens, but I've heard that in forests, it, they think, can be. They eat too much of the forest litter. They eat too much, yeah, yeah. But they are impressive looking. And they they're, are, yeah. And quite glossy. And, <laughs> and, and it seems like they're everywhere. I hope they're yeah. not crap. Well, I don't know if you said other earthworms are also not native. No, apparently not, which is kind of surprising. Um, what happens is people go fishing, and then at the end of the day, they dump out the earthworms that they didn't use, and that adds I, to helps them to And of course, the fishing worms are the big, <laughs> robust kind of worms. I guess, yeah, 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 yeah. We also have a couple of other programs, um, sort of offshoots. One is a master composter program. Um, the woman who runs the soil lab at UConn, where we all send our soil tests, um, is a very enthusiastic composter. And uh, she's probably the one who organized this Worm Day and also um, runs a master composter program, which is open to the public. And that's, I don't have the details on it, but it's maybe four or five sessions plus some field trips. Now we have three minutes left. Oh, my goodness, that went fast. It did go fast. <laughs> now, are you going to be at one of the upcoming farmers markets? I know you were going oh, to yes. be at the one that was sort of rained out last Friday. Yeah, right. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Yes, I plan to go on Friday the 16th. And I think Bob will be there also oh, good. again. Good doing a composting, composting. De Great. demonstration. Oh, good. So, you know, the Field of Green Farmers Market at um, Williams Park, right. 3 to 6 p.m., yeah. and s at some point during that, you'll be able to s talk to Susan oh, yeah. more about the Master Gardener program. Definitely, yeah. Bob is doing composting demos, uh -huh. and there are some good things to buy there as well in, in terms <laughs> yeah. of local vegetable mm -hmm. growers. Definitely, yeah. Oh, good, yes, good. glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I think Cindy Barry has done a great job with the farmer's market this year. Um, she also has this very active farm to school program of trying to get gardens set up. Uh, and and more and more of the schools have them. There's, yeah. a, there's now a, a garden at, at Jennings Elementary School that Fresh started oh, yes. This, yes. You know, a year or two ago. Mm -hmm. And Winthrop has had one for a while. And I think there's a master gardener who's working with the Fresh project. Yeah, somebody told me about it. I, somebody I know, but I, I hadn't talked to her, but I, I'd heard that. So, um, yeah, it, the, the difficulty with the schools, of course, is that gardening is done in the summer and people aren't always around, so it takes right. some juggling to get, get everybody working together. Yeah. But Potentially, it, it would be great to get the families of the students. It really would, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm told we're down to two minutes, so mm -hmm. maybe just in the last couple minutes, let people know again how to get in touch with you. Okay. Um, yes, there's the website, which I guess is still up there, is it? Uh, Mastergardener.yukon.edu. We're accepting applications now for the 2016 class, which will start in January. So anybody interested should go to that website, download the application, and send it in to me, um, or to whatever extension center you want to go to. They're all there on the application. Um, you can email me at susan.munger at yukon.edu. And I'm, there, I'm only there two days a week, but I do check my email all the time. So if anybody has questions, wants to know more about it, um, just uh, send me an email. Well, thank you, Susan. Um, just to let everyone know, the next two shows are going to be pre-taped, not live because uh, the League of Women Voters is going to be sponsoring candidate forums mm -hmm. uh, next Tuesday and the following Tuesday. So we will have shows. They will be also candidate interviews. <laughs> uh, and until we'll be back live in three weeks. So thank you, Susan. Well, thank it was you, fun. Anna. Yes, that was and good. And we'll see you all in a couple of weeks okay. around town. Good, good, good. Well, that was good of you to download Worm Day. Yes, that always catches Oh yeah, I like this. I was raised down at Fort Trumbull. Warm friends and family around.
mí What's now a blighted neighborhood Overlook a river to the sea Soon all that'll be left of it Will be nothing but them good old memories Them parking lots How in an L.D.C. Christmas Settle me at your house, not mine Have a little decent Christmas Where I become Christmas time I smell an eviction coming Round in London This Christmas time You know, it smells so good down by that sewer plant Christmas. 